Hello and welcome to Occupied Thoughts, a podcast brought to you by the Foundation for Middle East Peace. I'm Peter Beinart, a non-resident fellow at the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Today is June 3rd, 2022, and I'm delighted to be here with Walid Shahid. Walid is the spokesperson and communications director for Justice Democrats, the grassroots progressive organization that recruited and helped elect representatives Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Cori Bush, and Jamal Bowman, as well as congressional candidate Summer Lee, and launched the campaign for a Green New Deal. And the reason that I was particularly keen uh, to talk to you today, uh, Walid, is that um, it's become, I think, increasingly clear in recent weeks that um, something about the political dynamic, the, the terms of the electoral fight between APAC and its allies and progressive folks who support Palestinian rights has changed as a result of new institutions that have been created on the kind of APAC side that have been able to, to, to use, to dump huge amounts of money into races against candidates who are sympathetic to Palestinian rights. So I would love to start by you talking a little bit about what you think has changed. Yeah, I think um, to start from the beginning, um, this all really begins with the 2016 candidacy of Bernie Sanders uh, for president, which revealed um, that there was about 40% of the Democratic Party electorate that wanted a Bernie Sanders style um, social democratic, democratic socialist politics. And um, in the House of Representatives and the Senate, that was not the case. <laughs> um, you know, 40% of Democrats in Washington were not representative of Bernie Sanders' views about um, economic or social policy. And so um, a major piece of that was Bernie Sanders' foreign policy views with respect to um, not just Israel-Palestine, but also um, his views on Saudi Arabia, his views on Iran, his views on not Latin America. And um, you've seen that ideological framework that Bernie Sanders had be expanded and continue to be run through organizations like ours and then candidates like AOC, um, Ayanna Presley, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, and then in 2020 with Jamal Bowman and Cori Bush and Jessica Cisneros to Summer Lee, which was uh, the election just happened a month ago. And so I say all that just to say that, like, to start there, because um, in, 26, in, in 2016, 2018, with Bernie and AOC, like, and even Ilhan and Rashida and Ayanna Presley, um, the establishment forces in Washington were kind of caught off guard by um, those two, uh, 2016 and 2018. And then in 2020 with Jamal Bowman's candidacy was the first time where we saw major, um, major spending and major organizing by the foreign policy establishment, um, particularly by the Democratic Majority for Israel, in 2020, APAC did not have a super PAC. Um, now they do. And, um, and similar to the way the Justice Democrats expanded after AOC's victory, um, it was really Elliot Engel's loss that I think catalyzed um, Democratic Majority for Israel to grow and get more aggressive and invest early. And then for APAC um, to launch its own super PAC that's even bigger than the DMFI. Um, and then there's a lot of affiliated groups that have different names that are also adjacent to um, uh, the foreign policy goals of APEC and DMFI um, that have spent a lot against Jessica Cisneros and Summer Lee, who are um, two progressive candidates that we recruited. Um, so there's been, um, you know, in both the Summer Lee race and the Jessica Cisneros race, APEC was uh, essentially the number one spender in those races. Um, races that never had a public debate about Israel-Palestine <laughs> at all. Um, and uh, there was no very little discussion, public discussion that voters could access that was about Israel-Palestine um, because, you know, um, the kinds of, uh, the, these groups, these groups know that many voters don't care about Israel-Palestine and so they spend lots of money on ads that basically just attack the candidate's biggest vulnerabilities, um, even if they have no respect to, no relationship to their foreign policy goals. So um, I'll stop there and I don't, I don't know, uh, Peter, maybe you can ask me another question, but I just wanted to give like the large, yeah, from 2016 to now, like how we've ended up here. Um, but I do think they, they are responding to the left kind of going on, 
um, the offense post 2016. And now they were kind of in like Star Wars episode five, where the empire strikes back, so to speak. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, so um, it is, it, it has been a difficult year. So let's talk about, about how this has played out in certain different races and what kind of lessons one can learn from it. Um, so you mentioned Summer Lee. This is a, a, a case where um, uh, despite uh, her and her being and her supporters being outspent, I think by a significant margin, um, she was actually able to win a, a, a narrow victory over um, a more moderate candidate who kind of shared APAC's views on, on Israel Palestine. What are, what are the lessons that you think you can draw from, from her victory? Um, well, so Summer Lee was a sitting um, state representative representing the, um, the areas of Braddock and Pittsburgh. People might know Braddock as also being the town that John Fetterman is from. Um, uh, Deindustrialized, high poverty town, extremely um, diverse town, um, home to one of the largest steel mills on the East Coast, or I guess it's not the East Coast, but in the Eastern United States. And then um, yeah, I think she has really made a name for herself in that community as a progressive democratic fighter. Um, you know, APAC and uh, DMFI's um, case against Summer Lee was that she was not an authentic Democrat. She was actually a Republican and she was a Republican because she opposed Joe Biden in the primary um, and said some uh, critical things of Joe Biden in the primary. Um, you know, if we took that as our standard bearer of what makes you Republican, then Kamala Harris would be a Republican because she had the most, uh, you know, one of the most aggressive statements against Joe Biden in the debates, as we all remember about school segregation. And so um, I think one we have found, a, I think one, like the candidate really matters, someone who is someone who can really voters can trust. And so people knew Summer Lee as their Democratic state representative. So the ads that APAC was running against her didn't at land as fully as they might have with a candidate that maybe had a little bit less of a record that people didn't know as much. Um, and honestly, like most of our candidates are not like Summer Lee, like Jamal Bowman had no political experience whatsoever. Uh, he was a principal. Um, and so that went well for us with Summer Lee. And then the second thing was, um, you know, Justice Democrats also had an independent expenditure where we were able to go on offense against Apex candidate, uh, Steve Irwin, um, Steve Irwin is someone who has literally donated money to Pat Toomey, the Republican Senator of Pennsylvania. And so we thought we obviously didn't have as much money as APAC or DMFI did, but um, the inve our independent arms ability to make a case against Steve Irwin on the same basis that they were making against Summer Lee with even stronger evidence. Summer Lee has never donated to a Republican. Um, also went really far. But, you know, the race with Steve Irwin you know, in their own internal numbers, went up 25 points in the polls after APAC made their TV advertisements against Summer Lee. And so, um, you know, with it's, it shows how effective these advertisements can be that it can convince many lower information voters that their sitting Democratic representative um, who, you know, attended a Joe Biden rally in October of 2020 and spoke at it um, is a Republican. Like these TV ads can go a long way. Um, so you need to have a, yeah, just a candidate who can be an authentic messenger who people can trust. And then also you have to go on offense against their attacks, um, the candidate themselves and the, the independent groups like ours who are able to go on air and do mailers about how, um, yeah, the, about um, our message. And did some really have a, a, a record of uh, support for Palestinian rights? I mean, what was APAC so worried about it? Was it more just that she seemed like she was progressive in general and they felt like the, somehow the vibe of the squad would kind of, you know, wash over her? Or... <laughs> you know, Summer Lee had one tweet um, mm. uh, during the Sheikh Jarrah um, mm. incidents that were happening where she said something like, um, she said something like, as a black woman, I understand what it feels like to be, um, feel like you're occupied or something. And um, okay. yeah, and so that was the tweet that was being circulated by um, in Jewish press um, and Israeli press about Summer Lee. Um, there was actually a Jewish local newspaper in Pittsburgh that used that tweet to, 
to then um, use that tweet as a source for Summer Lee's um, uh, basically like accusing her of anti-Semitism through that tweet. Mm. So that was what they were going off of. But, you know, Jessica Cisneros has, from what I know of, no public statements about Israel, Palestine whatsoever. She's the candidate and, in, in San Antonio and Texas who's running, uh, who, who primary was just last week, right? Yeah, she is running. Um, this is still ha- the, uh, the election happened, but the votes still haven't been called by um, official observers. But she's running against an anti-choice pro-NRA Democrat Henry Cuellar. Um, and APEC was uh, one of the number one spenders in that race against Jessica Cisneros. But um, Cisneros, to my knowledge, has zero public statements about Israel-Palestine. She was endorsed by J Street um, and she was endorsed by Justice Democrats. And so I think through the basis of that, APEC determined and one of APEC's affiliates, um, mainstream Democrats PAC determined that she was not um, sufficiently loyal to the Israeli government's line or um, whatever their ideological line is. And so, um, yeah, that was all that was between those two candidates. That's basically all the public information we have about them. But I think they I think they understand the way that the the uh, you know, they're taking they're taking the same kinds of the, 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 the same kind of political theory that we had in 2016, 2018, which is like, if there are certain ideological policy elements that you care about in um, a political party, uh, you know, and for Justice Democrats, climate change and healthcare were our major are were our number two, uh, one, number one and number two priorities that the battle to effectively move a party on that issue is in these primaries. And so I think APEC and DMFI have determined, come to the same conclusion that in order to discipline and punish um, the party for straying too much from, um, you know, a right wing view of uh, the Israeli Palestinian conflict into the occupation, they have to discipline and punish through their involvement in primaries. And I can I can say it, it, it has been effective for them. So I wanted to talk about ask you about another race a little bit earlier on or uh, um, two, two, two races in the same district between the same candidates in Cleveland between Chantel Brown and Nina Turner. This was a case where the APAC supported candidate won. Um, and I wonder what lessons you take from that, you know, that less, less happy outcome. Yeah, um, you know, we, we backed just, we, uh, just Democrats backed Nina Turner in her first race. Um, we did not, uh, we were not involved in the second race. Um, you know, I think Nina Turner had very explicit comments about Joe Biden that were um, that just were not true of Summer Lee, um, and her opposition was much more, um, uh, yeah, verbalized. And um, I think that uh, you know, if looking back on it, I think. The case against Nina Turner was that she was also a Republican and not a loyal Biden Democrat. I think Nina Turner could have done a much better job, like calling herself a a Democrat. I think her first ad that she put out didn't mention that she was a Democrat, which I thought was a bit of an unforced error. Um, You know, I think like um, there was also an element of people thinking too much that she was a Bernie candidate. And mm-hmm. I think that can narrow you a bit when you have to win usually f- over 50% of a primary. Mm-hmm. And I don't think Bernie won over 50% of that district in his presidential runs. Um, and, you know, like a lot of candidacies have done more uh, explicitly Jewish outreach. So mm-hmm. Summer Lee had um, many people involved in Jewish institutions who were organizing on her behalf and Jamal Bowman did. Um, Jessica Cisneros has a, doesn't have a very high Jewish population from in her district from what I'm aware of, but um, you know, I read in uh, Jewish Currents that Nina Turner did not have a Jewish outreach program. And I think some of that stuff is helpful for dealing with mm-hmm. disinformation and misinformation that people um, are hearing about candidates. candidates. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, yeah, so there's, those are some things that people could learn from that. J Street did not endorse Nina Turner in that race, which is also a little different from, you know, J Street did endorse Summer Lee and Jessica Cisneros. Um, so there are 
um, in terms of groups that care about the occupation and wanting to end it, um, you know, I would encourage them to see where the see where the winds are blowing in some of these primaries and, and get involved as much as they can. Right. Um, do you? Um, I'm curious. You mentioned earlier that Summer Lee is from the. Uh, represents the same town that the Pennsylvania Senate candidate John Fetterman is from. It seems like in the Senate races, we haven't even really gotten to the stage where you have candidates who have a progressive enough view on Israel-Palestine that they're even worth backing, or for that matter, worth quashing. Am, am I, you know, right. Fetterman doesn't seem like he's taken a progressive position on this, even though he's considered to be a fairly progressive guy in other ways. Is that, is that right? And if so, what's, why the difference between the city Senate and House races? I think that's right. I mean, this is a tricky topic to talk about because it's, it is ultimately a lot to do with money. And mm -hmm. um, I think these Senate races are so expensive mm -hmm. that Senate, Senate uh, effective and uh, pragmatic Senate, Senate mm -hmm. candidates like Fetterman um, want to do whatever they can to win. So why, if, if, and this is the success of APAC and BMFI, why alienate or why uh, provoke um, these super PACs from getting involved against you when you can quote, take the easy way out and say, you know, which is what Fetterman did, I am pro-Israel and I've always been pro-Israel, um, which doesn't say anything really, but it says enough to uh, send the signals to the right groups that you're not an adversary. And so um, because these races are so expensive, people are really worried of, and so competitive, people are really worried about um, yeah, provoking special interest groups from getting involved in these races. Um, you know, that just Chris Murphy um, seems to have the same views as Andy Levin on Israel-Palestine. Um, you know, maybe people think he's too safe to be primaried or something. Again, like primarying a Senate candidate is extremely, a Senate incumbent is extremely difficult because of the, uh, yeah, just because of the spending required to reach that many voters. But um, yeah, I think you're right that um, this has not reached the Senate level. Mm. So you must talk to candidates a lot and, and I'm sure you have these conversations all the time. What, what do you say to someone who says, look, Willie, you know, I just need to get in there into Congress so I can work on healthcare and climate change and saving America from the Republican assault on democracy. And I, this issue just is not, important enough to me and my voters to be willing to basically to potentially torpedo my chances. So I'm going to just, you know, I'm going to cave on that, on that issue as a practical, pragmatic decision. How do you convince the person not to? That's a good question. I mean, what you just, your previous question and this one just made me also think about Raphael Warnock, who had made comments yes. about yes. Yes. Um, Israel, Palestine from his own, you know, black egalitarian, you know, theological tradition. Um, and a trip that he took there, right. And, oh, and a trip that he took there and then basically had to retract his yes. statements. Yes, I didn't really see all those things that I actually described <laughs> when I was there, right. Yeah, I was really sad to see that, you know, yeah. one or two months before his election. But, um, and yeah, I think, you know, a lot of the candidates I work with um, have no, have very little experience or relationship to this issue. Um, other than they know it's, um, you know, a thorny issue <laughs> in which if they say the wrong thing, they will, something bad will happen to them. Um, you know, I, um, I do try to get them to meet with as many experts on the issue as possible, ask all the questions they have, um, you know, in spaces that feel private and safe for them to do so. Um, I, um, you know, People send them readings and briefings. Um, I also, you know, I also, I do think there's an element, especially because of DMFI and APEC, that people are like, why don't I just say the easy thing, which is to, to satisfy these groups from not spending against me. And, um, you know, it is not in the self-interest, the like pragmatic self-interest of our candidates or Justice Democrats as an organization to encourage other groups to spend against our candidates from a purely self-interested perspective. Um, but from a moral and ideological and like spiritual perspective, I do try to encourage our candidates to draw linkages between their domestic um, social justice values. And, you know, some of our candidates are religious from their religious social justice values to foreign policy, whether that's 
Israel, Palestine or Latin America or, um, you know, the, Sa the Saudi led war in Yemen. Um, and to say like, well, how, how, why would you say it is not, it is not true to your values to just take a stance for political purposes and self-interested purposes. And that's not the kinds of candidates we're interested in supporting because once you do that on one issue, you're going to do that on every other issue, um, whether it's climate or healthcare or, um, you know, what private prisons or whatever. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, there are hard conversations. I think always the, I, I encourage them to talk to, um, Jews and Palestinians in their districts also, just to know the sense of where people are at in their districts, um, and to talk to people who disagree with them. Like the number one thing is I don't want a candidate to do is be shocked when someone disagrees with them about, um, you know, a kind of progressive perspective about, um, foreign policy. So those are some of the things, but, um, yeah, it is, it is getting, it is, it is difficult. Oftentimes the way these things are framed in terms of the politics is kind of, you know, you've got APAC from the kind of right wing of the um, American Jewish community coming in and having a big impact and then maybe a lesser impact of kind of J Street on the more progressive side of the American Jewish community. But I'm curious about um, how significant, you know, there are other groups of Americans who have equities and particular concerns in this issue in different ways. Obviously Palestinian Americans and in different ways, Arab Americans, or Muslim Americans might have a particular interest. Do you, and these, you know, to make a sweeping generation tend to often be more immigrant communities. Do you feel like those communities are starting to have a political impact on this issue? What signs do you see or, and what might be uh, the obstacles to, to that? I think there's a burgeoning um, but small network of Palestinian and Arab Americans who um, Israel, Palestine is their number one issue and are seeing that, you know, if you stick your neck out a little bit on this issue for Palestinian rights and or even just an even handed approach, which Andy Levin has, um, the, that you'll, you know, people will spend you know, one to six million dollars against you, and so to uh, say, sorry, people who are not. Andy Levin is a Democratic congressman in Michigan, running in a runoff against another Democratic congressman. The APAC is supporting his opponent because he supports this kind of two-state bill, and J Street is supporting him. So anyway, just as background, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, but yeah, I would say it's still very small, and um, you know, and it's fledgling in a fledgling state there. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, um, I th my, ex my limited experience talking to Palestinian operatives and donors is that um, they really never felt like there was a space for them in the Democratic Party or, or in congressional politics. And that has started to change since mm -hmm. 2018 um, with the election of uh, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar and AOC. Um, but um, and yeah, and, and Palestinian donors uh, and our organizations want to support Palestinian candidates, um, you know, from a representative place, but also from a trust place. They've experienced so many times that um, people, you know, betray them and betray their cause and are really traumatized from those experiences. And so mm -hmm. think electoral politics is a place where either the, the movement is not ready or it's a place of ultimately where betrayal happens and there's no space for it. So like kinds of more 501c3 educational efforts might be a safer place and a more pure place to put your, put your money and resources. But I think it's starting to grow. For the, again, I will say for the, the vast majority of our supporters, our donors and volunteers, Israel, Palestine is really not their number one, number two or number three concern. Um, it's usually things like healthcare, racial justice, or climate change. I would say, but um, yeah, I think I think over. I think I am optimistic that um, whether it's groups like J Street or whether it's more um, Palestinian-led organizations, that people will start to see primaries as the battleground for where the where the soul of the Democratic Party will gr go on foreign policy with respect to Israel-Palestine, as it has on so many other issues. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, one of the things that I noticed came up a fair amount in the summer Lee race was, you know, charges that APAC was, you know, attacking a progressive black woman. Um, her, her opponent, Steve Irwin, was a, you know, was a white guy. Um, and um, but it, it seems like in a certain kind of way, 
APAC and its supporters have are trying to flip that script um, in uh, in the in the Rashida Tlaib race, where they're one of the things that this new group that Bakari Sellers has started has been saying as well. It's bad that Detroit doesn't have any black members of Congress representing it, um, and and the implication that somehow you know Rashida Tlaib's because she's Palestinian, she's distracted by these issues far away, and she's not focusing on the things that are interesting. I I just wonder. I'll just put my cards on the table. I was worried about the framing in the Summer Lee race that that basically what was wrong was that APAC was attacking a black woman because it just seemed to me that APAC was smart enough to be able to play this game and to find people who, you know, they could find people, candidates of color they have been able to. And they uh, and um, and the real issue is this, that they're opposed to candidates irrespective of their race, religion, or ethnicity who support Palestinian rights. But how do you think in the Rashidi Tlaib race, um, the, what do you think the right way for folks to respond is to that kind of that 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 argument about racial representation. Yeah, I think that's a good question. I mean, Chantal Brown was also a black woman who mm -hmm. um, DMFIs and I think APEC also supported. I don't know if their super PAC was around by her second campaign, but um, yeah, I think, look, the um, Bakari seller is adjacent super PAC that is also APEC adjacent and right. uh, Wall Street adjacent if you count. Um, their number one donor being a um, from a from that background, he um, I think that uh, you know one of the sad things about that kinds of argument is that nobody wins. Like um, that district that Rashida is running in is one is I think the most Palestinian district in the United States, <laughs> and so and um, definitely one of the most Arab districts in the United States. And so um, to say that. Uh, to say that she has no right to represent that community in Congress and this other marginalized community does, it just is an argument where everyone suffers, I think. Um, but um, yeah, I don't think, I think that, you know, the thing that I will say is that like, obviously APEC and DMFI's singular primary focus is to discipline and punish the party around the lines of Israel-Palestine. But it's not, that far off to say that they're also aligned with generally the more moderate wing of the party overall speaking right. um, on the other host of issues. Um, you know, uh, Mark Melman, for instance, sits on the board of a of an organization that um, does not support Black Lives Matter and the movement for Black Lives policing policies um, and, you know, has frequently written columns about the party moving too far to the left, not on Israel, Palestine, but on Right. climate, immigration, other issues. And yeah. so, um, yeah, I think, I think that uh, I'm not sure that that argument is the um, primary one to make, but it's also difficult because what the press tends to, if, if, Rashid, if Rashida or Summer Lee or Jessica Cisneros says, the reason they're spending against me is because they want to have, they want to make sure that every candidate running for office is afraid of speaking up um, for human rights everywhere. The way the press covers that is that um, Jessica Cisneros or Rashida Tlaib is obsessed with Israel, <laughs> right, right, right. Um, when right. or, or or is singling out Israel, right? Um, right, right. And um, yeah. yeah, so it's it's hard. It's a tricky situation. So the last question I want to ask you, which is a little more uh, personal, is that you found yourself in the midst of a bit of a, a firestorm. Uh, I don't know, it was a couple weeks ago. Um, when uh, uh, Anti-Defamation League, the head of the Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt, singled out a tweet, a kind of a, a, a joke that you had made about this or this Jewish publication, Jewish Insider, where you had joked that, uh, you know, you had you had kind of played off it and used the word goy outsider. And then Jonathan Greenblatt, who's been on this tear about the idea that, you know, um, people who are anti-Zionists are, are the equivalent of white nationalists kind of singled you out as, as evidence of this. And I'm just interested in, um, I think what was, I was glad to see that a lot of people came to your defense and, uh, and, and kind of challenged him about this. But um, I'm just curious um, what it was like to be in the middle of that. I mean, in the sense that if part of what happens in these dynamics is that candidates, and not just candidates, other people in public life, kind of, you know, are get intimidated uh, by threats of being called, you know, names that no one wants to be called, um, uh, or at least nobody decent wants to be called. Um, well, I just wanted to mention what that was, the experience was like for you and what lessons you would draw from it. Yeah, I mean, the days after that were quite an experience for me. Um, I think originally I thought, I just thought it was funny. 
I was just like, this is ridiculous. Like, are you serious right now? Uh, I also didn't understand even the connection he was drawing between what I had said mm. as a joke um, and my, that the association of that with the far right. And like the thing I tweeted, I did check in with like a couple of uh, Jewish colleagues and friends of mine. And I was like, do you, do you think this is anti-Semitic? And um, they all said the same thing, which was, it's not anti-Semitic, but your joke isn't that funny either, which I thought was like a perfectly Jewish response to a non-Jew asking if their joke was anti-Semitic. <laughs> but um, yeah, I um, it also just made me sad because there was no way to, I felt very powerless about it. I felt very much like, you know, I didn't want to say something that made it seem like, well, some of my best friends are Jewish right. <laughs> and like, right. um, and I was like, I don't really know what to say to this. Um, and, um, and the truth, and then there's a political truth that like the publication I was making fun of is an outlet yes. that often is a mouthpiece for DMFI and APEC. Yes, and, um, and the story that they were running that I was making fun of was about how Apex candidate actually was successful in a race he lost, and they buried the lead that Summer Lee defeated the Apex candidate. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to point out, in a uh, you know, uh, in a way, in a you know, uh, an, an unartful way that that was um, just funny to me. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I had a CNN anchor reach out to me and um, D DM me and like say really nasty things to me. You all can. Uh, you all maybe can guess which anchor that was. I won't say the name, but um, it was really hard. And um, yeah, just the sense of powerlessness that I felt because I'm like, there's no place of recourse I can have to like, um, to have Jonathan Greenblatt hear my side. And then he, oh, sorry, my phone started to ring. Let me just turn this off. There we go. Um, yeah, there was no place of, recourse or justice or conversation even about right. this and um then when he made when the adl made their second comment that the reason jonathan greenblatt you know the ceo of the largest jewish civil rights organization in the united states the reason he decided to say that I, what i was doing was anti-semitic was because my organization and i single out israel when the um when you know some of the largest spenders against the candidates i'm running against, I'm, I'm sorry, some of the largest spenders against the candidates I work for um, are groups that single out Israel <laughs> for uh, not having any, um, uh, you know, not being beholden to any of our values as Americans right. around, uh, around foreign policy. So it was quite a whirlwind. You know, some of the candidates I work for also reached out to me in a humorous way where they were like, you've been trying to help me not get um, canceled <laughs> Yeah. for my views and now look you're the one you're the one yeah. who is getting uh ridiculed by the head of the largest jewish civil rights organization so i don't know i mean it was really beautiful to see so many uh jewish leaders speak out on my behalf um mm. very immediately after and i felt very touched by that mm. um but yeah i don't know um i don't really yeah i don't really know what to say about it other than that yeah i mean i i uh, i you know, it seems to me there's such a deep irony here and that this is this is such a perfect illustration of the kind of dynamics of cancel culture, you know, that that when it plays out on other issues, you know, um, people getting called racist or homophobic or sexist or whatever, you have all these people on the right, you know, including big supporters of Israel who who feel like this is the end of the world that this kind of thing happens because they can so identify with the idea that they may get called racist unfairly and that they would feel kind of powerless and they wouldn't know where to get their reputation. And yet it's, it just drives me crazy that some of those same people do that so promiscuously on this issue and that they, there's no accountability. I mean, you know, that, that people should have to think twice, three times before lobbying, lobbying charges that have really powerful effects on people's lives. Um, they should really have to do their homework. They should reach out to those people. They should really be careful. They should have a kind of, I think, a kind of reverence for the power and the importance of a, of, of, of a charge like anti-Semitism, because you're essentially trading on the moral power of, you know, the history of Jewish suffering. And yet, 
you know, the, and, and yet the way people use, the way people like Jonathan Greenblatt use this phrase, um, it seems to be so much a kind of desecration of that. Um, so, um, so anyway, it, 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 it drives me crazy, but I'm, I'm very glad to see that, you know, you kind of come through it. And, um, and I also think that perhaps people who share your values, irrespective of whether they're Jewish or not, maybe are better organized um, uh, and more, more, you know, better organized around these issues, um, better able to respond um, than maybe they would have, we would have been a few years ago. And I think that's a positive development. Yeah, I think the last thing I'll say about it is just also to equate not just me, but, um, you know, this is Greenblatt's kind of ideological point of view to equate the progressive movement writ large with the Buffalo shooter is just really sad and really, um, you know, to the, it's just, um, it's where it's kind of like where this, this thing happens where every nail needs a hammer. And so like every progressive needs to be hammered with this yeah. thing in order for there to be a both sides equivalent that Trump, Trump, and then the Buffalo uh, shooter and then um, justice Democrats are all equal in terms of our problems with anti-Semitism when um, you know when Greenblatt did make his statements apologizing for his uh, organization's role in um, in uh, being part of the efforts to stop the so-called ground zero mosque from being constructed I thought that was a step forward and like right. a way of extending the extending an arm across the aisle and in the Trump era to like really forge bonds of solidarity against right. um, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism yeah. and white supremacy. And then for him to, in the week of the Buffalo shooting, just um, choose me as his target. Right. Um, it's just really, yeah, disheartening. And like, um, there's, again, there's no accountability for it. For it to right, like right, right. Really reckon with how wrong that is. Yes, yes, right. No, and I think the point you're implying is just, I'll say it openly, which is that I think it's, you know, it's not coincidental that you, as a you know, as an American Muslim, you know, were were were, were attacked this way. I think whether in consciously and subconsciously. I mean, I think if you just look at the disparity between the way people talk about Ilhan Omar or Rishi Tlaib on the one hand or Betty McCollum on the other, there's a way in whether people are willing to admit this to themselves or not that this kind of discourse lands especially heavily on um, on American Muslims um, in a way that I think is just. Um, uh, you know, the grounds that, that um, I think uh, to me, you know, fuels, fuels very, very dangerous forms of bigotry that the ADL of all organizations should recognize it shouldn't be complicit in. Um, um, I don't want to take any more of your time. Um, uh, Waleed, thank you for- um, uh, yeah, Thanks for having me. Sure. Um, let me just uh, say to the folks out there that, um, uh, that you should please make sure to check out the FMVP website, fmvp.org, for resources related to this podcast and lots of other great content related to Palestine and Israel. And please make sure you are subscribed to this podcast to stay up to date. You can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Spotify, and you can also watch videos, video versions of our podcast, including this one on YouTube. And with that, I'm Peter Beinart signing off until the next episode of FMVP's Occupied Thoughts. I can just hop off. <laughs>